I wanted to start by telling you a little bit about how I got into this work. I'm, I was an immigrant child. My uh, family came to the United States when I was five and a half years old from, from India, and our, the first place we lived was a rural community in upstate New York where I learned to speak English while, uh, while saying the Pledge of Allegiance in a two-room schoolhouse in first grade. And I spent my entire childhood watching tons and tons of television and wanting nothing more than to be an American, to be fully American, to fit right in. And I thought I got all my lessons about that from the TV. I, I really, I watched something like five hours of TV a day and no one stopped me. I like to think of myself as evidence that it's okay to park your kids in front of the TV and walk away. <laughs> They're gonna be fine. <laughs> Although TV is, of course, very different now than it was when, when I was growing up. So by the time I got to college, I, everything I had absorbed told me that the best thing to do was to forget that I had brown skin and had not been born in this country. I grew up in white factory towns and uh, wanted to eat hot dogs and pizza for dinner every night because I thought that was the thing that would make me an American. And so by the time I got to college, I was so allergic to any sense of myself as a person of color that I actually skipped the pre-orientation program that my campus held for students of color uh, who were coming into their first year. Today, people think of me as a professional woman of color because I've done racial justice work for so long, the way you may think of Pat Buchanan as a professional white man. <laughs> but, but I have not always been that person. I grew up as a person who really did not want to see race. And what happened to me was that in my second year of college, there was, a, there was an incident on our campus, a, a black a uh, first year student had been beaten up by two white football players. And that incident sparked a whole campaign for racial justice, not just to have that particular incident of violence dealt with, but to get new faculty on campus of color and to build a curriculum that spoke to the uh, needs of the students of color on our campus. And there were these meetings and rallies happening and I was sitting them all out. They, they, I thought that had nothing to do with me. But one night, I was fortunate enough to be hanging out with two very good friends of mine, Valerie and Yuko. And there was going to be a rally the next day and they wanted me to go. And I said, no, I'm not gonna go. I'm not interested in that. That's not for me. And my friends did an intervention on me like you would do um, <laughs> in, uh, with someone who was on drugs. Because denial, of course, is a drug in and of itself, right? You give yourself a dose, you feel better for a time, uh, but it wears off and then you have to give yourself some more because uh, reality is always in front of us. So my friend said to me, listen, Rinku, you are not a girl anymore, you're a woman now, and you're not a minority, you're a person of color. This was 1984 when that language was just beginning to be used. And they basically told me it is time to grow up and go to the rally. So I did. <laughs> uh, reader, I went to the rally. So I went to the rally and I can't explain it really even to this day, but for the first time in the 12 years since my family had immigrated from India, I actually felt like I belonged. I belonged at that somewhat straggly rally with badly made signs and boring chants 20, 25 people, uh, and I belonged there because that was the moment that I understood being an American is not about looking like Marsha Brady, it's about making an investment in the community in which you find yourself and doing everything you can with the other people in that community to make it the most inclusive, most compassionate, most effective community that it can be.